So if I were to ask you, what is the most powerful force in the natural world? What would you say it is? Fusion? That energy engine that drives the stars of our universe? Perhaps gravity, that force that holds those stars and planets in an orbit and keeps us stuck to this Earth. How about the atomic bond, B-O-N-D, not B-O-M-B? You know, the force that holds neutrons and protons together in the nucleus that, when split apart, causes a nuclear explosion. What if I said to you, suggest to you, that the most powerful force in the universe is sound? Ah, oh, I sense some skepticism out there. Because sound just seems so innocuous, doesn't it? I mean, there are some sound waves that we can hear, some that we can only detect by using instruments. But what is sound? It's vibrations, it's frequencies that our eardrums are able to pick up. But again, not all of them. But did you know that every atom in the universe vibrates at a certain frequency? The universe hums. And according to string theorists, it's this hum, then, that causes these packets of energy to organize themselves into gluons and mesons. Gluons and mesons come together as quarks. Quarks come together as protons, neutrons, electrons. Protons, neutrons, and electrons come together as atoms. Atoms as elements. Elements as compounds. Compounds as substances all organized because of sound. It's the amplitude of the waves, not the frequency that causes the reactivity. Sound is the force behind all those other forces. Why is it that soldiers break cadence before they cross a bridge? Because if the soldiers kept in step, they would create a frequency, an oscillation, that may match the bridge's support structures and cause the whole bridge to collapse. Why is it that the Tacoma Bridge collapsed in a 32-mile-an-hour wind? Because that suspension bridge, the wind caused it, started causing an oscillation that again matched the structure of that bridge and amplified and magnified it so that the whole thing collapsed into the river. Why is it that the song Louie Louie cannot be played at a Clemson football game? Because they discovered that that song gives off certain frequencies that match the frequency of the support structures of the stadium, causing the concrete to crack and crumble. So is it surprising, then, that when God gets his people together to shout and yell and trumpets blast, that the walls of Jericho would collapse? Unreinforced walls in a city that's smaller than Clemson Stadium. Thus begins the battle for the promised land. Chapter 7 of the story begins with Joshua and the people of Israel on the east side of the Jordan River. But a crisis in leadership has occurred. If you remember verse 2 of our text today, Moses, my servant, is dead. Do you realize how frightening that was to the people? How crisis-inducing that was. Moses was the only leader they had known. All those Israelites that had come out of Egypt were now dead. This was a totally new generation. They had only known Moses as their leader. And now he is dead. Everyone knows that when there's a change in leadership, there's other changes coming as well. And change causes fear and uncertainty. Would God be with Joshua the way he was with Moses? Oh, the people had some history with Joshua already. You know, he was one of the two spies that made a good report on Cain. And, you know, ten were bad and two were good. That was Joshua and Caleb. But they wondered... Would Joshua be a good leader? So the first thing Joshua does is assemble the people together and say, prepare yourselves, tomorrow we're going to march into the promised land. He had the priests come first, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. When the priest's feet 
hit the Jordan River, the water stopped flowing. It dried up so that the people were able to cross on dry land. Once on the other side, they have a covenant renewal ceremony where the Sinai covenant was read, all its stipulations, all its blessings, all its curses. And the people agreed, yes, we will follow this covenant. The males were circumcised to bring them in alignment with this covenant. And once that healing took place, then God said, go to Jericho, take the city. But he told them to take it using unconventional military strategy. Walk around the city once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. And after the seventh lap, everyone shout and blow their trumpets. Yeah, that sounds like great military strategy, doesn't it? But when they did it, the walls collapsed. They routed the city. Everything in that city was to be killed or destroyed. Every man, every woman, every child, except for Rahab and her family. But everything was to be killed. Everything was to be burned except the precious metals and gems which were to be put into the temple treasury. From there they took march toward Ai, the fortified city. But they lost at Ai. They were defeated. Why? The people wondered. They were perplexed. You said you would be with us, Lord. But it was discovered that Achan had taken some of the gold of Jericho and kept it for himself rather than putting it in the temple treasury. Once that theft was remedied, they easily conquered Ai. And all the kings then from in that area gathered together, trying to make alliances with each other to stop the invasion force. But God caused hailstones to rain down and kill some of the soldiers. He extended the day for them to finish a battle at one time. From Hazar in the north to Beersheba in the south, the whole of the country was conquered by the people of Israel, except, except for those lying, deceitful Jebusites who tricked Joshua into making a treaty with them. Joshua made a treaty with the Jebusites before consulting God. See, even God's hand-picked people make mistakes. But this mistake proved fatal for the people of Israel. Because instead of having the promised land completely wiped out of all idols' worship, you had the Jebusites who worshipped the Baals and the Astartes and Molech and other false gods. And soon that temptation became too great for the people of Israel who also started worshipping other gods besides the one true God. That's the book of Joshua, chapter 7 of the story. What's God trying to tell us in this chapter? What does it mean for you and me? Well, before we get into that, answer that specific question, we need to deal with an issue that I'm sure is going to come up, maybe came up in the Bible study this morning, I don't know, um, over here. Why did God tell the Israelites to wipe out every living thing, to kill every man, woman, and child? That just goes against our modern sensibility, doesn't it? It doesn't sound loving. It doesn't sound gracious. It sounds harsh. But we got to deal with that question because it goes to the heart of what the book of Joshua means for you and for me. Many people are troubled by the role that warfare plays in the conquest of the promised land. They try to assuage their ethical scruples and answer objections by coming up with answers such as, well, this was pre-Christian morality at the time. It It was before we had all the teachings of Jesus, and we just didn't know better at that time. And, of course, and that's the way warfare was just done in those days. But in the light of Jesus' teachings, oh, we know better now, and we wouldn't do things like that today. They try to repudiate this warfare and killing as if it was barbaric and pre-Christian. But in doing so, they really are admitting that Joshua is offensive to them. You see, the book of Joshua doesn't address itself to the abstract moral question about the ethics of war as a means to human goal. 
the book of Joshua, as all of Scripture, has to be seen in the light of redemption history. God's revealing of himself and his plan of salvation. Thus in Joshua, as we find in the rest of Scripture, you have this constant unveiling of law and gospel, sin and grace, judgment and mercy. Joshua is not a book about the epic battle for the promised land fought with the aid of a national god. No. Joshua is a book about the God to whom the whole world belongs at this stage of redemption history retook a portion of the earth from people who were not worshiping the one true God, who themselves were worshiping false gods and idols, sacrificing their infant and children to these false gods, worshiping their gods through drunkenness and orgy. No, the book of Joshua has to be seen as the battle between the true God and the false gods of this land. So when God called the children of Israel to be his agents to fight the battle against those idolatrous, dissolute um, uh, Canaanites, it was a battle for who was the one true God in this earth. The book of Joshua has to be seen through the lens of redemption history. When Joshua and the children of Israel conquered the promised land, it testified to the surrounding ancient people that there is only one God who has absolute control of this world. He alone is the one who owns and maintains ownership of this world. All other gods are merely false gods. So then, what does that mean for your life today? Oh yeah, it's a great testimony. God is in control. But what does that mean for you now? As I said a couple of weeks ago, everything in the Old Testament has a New Testament counterpart. This battle for the, in conquest of the Promised Land is likened in Scripture to our daily battle against the forces of evil in this world. The spiritual battle that we daily fight between the true God and following him and the false gods that tempt us in the world today. That's why St. Paul in our epistle lesson wrote, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not between us, folks. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. You and I are the new Israel, according to Scripture. And as we go through this wilderness of life, we're in a battle. We're in a battle with these forces of evil that are around us, while God is about going about the task of creating and remaking this new heaven and new earth for us. You see, God says that he will bring us to the promised land and that we will ultimately have the victory. But it's not going to be an easy victory. It's not an easy, it wasn't an easy victory for the Israelites. Soldiers, Israel's soldiers were killed. Some of them were injured and maimed. Some of them endured hardship in those battles. It wasn't easy for them. God's not promising that it's going to be easy for us. But his promise is that we will ultimately have the victory. Ultimately, we will win the battle because he fights for us. And that's what he wants you to get today. Just as he fought for the Israelites, God is fighting for you as well. He's calling you to put on the full armor of God, that word of his that called the world into existence. Through prayer and devotion, let your heart and mind vibrate to the sounds of his mighty word so that through you, he can use you in this battle 
to be a witness to him, to show this world, as Israel did the ancient world, who is the one true God, who it is that controls and will be the ultimate victor. That's what this chapter is about for you and I. And don't think that you can avoid this battle, that you can just waltz through life (laughs) scot-free. Satan knows your weak spots. He knows what temptations to throw against you. You're not going to walk through scot-free. You're going to have battles to fight. You're going to have demons in your life to battle. And Satan knows those, and he'll use those. But we've got God fighting for us. When we fail, he's already helped us through Jesus, who will forgive our sins. But he's there by our side. We are God's agents. And as we go through this life, we are to put on the full armor of God. Battle, because ultimately, we're the victors. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.